Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual AAKP Policy Summit, Patient Voice and Patient Choice, Kidney Patients and Patient Networks Drive Inclusion of Patient Insights, Seek Care Innovation, and Demand Treatment Access. My name is Ed Hickey, and I'm the Vice President of the American Association of Kidney Patients and Chair of the AAKP Veterans Health Initiative. I'm a former Marine and an attorney who has been successfully managing chronic kidney disease over the last few years. As many of you who are watching today know, this is a very complex disease, but with a focus on personal responsibility and the expertise of an outstanding medical team, I've been successfully managing my disease as I pursue my career. I would especially like to extend my gratitude to my dietitian and nutritionist who have been such a tremendous help to me. Today, I'm pleased to introduce the following AKP friends and allies who will present on challenges and innovations to hitting the national radar, barriers to innovation, patient choice, and access to care. Part one, AAKP has a proud 50 year history of advocating both for innovations in kidney medicine, and just as importantly, timely patient consumer access to treatments. AAKP also believes that all kidney patients should have access to innovative treatments doctors view as the best to maintain optimal patient health and independence. We do not believe patient access to the best kidney treatments should be determined, limited, or denied based on the type of insurance you have, whether this is a private payer, federal employee, VA healthcare, or Medicare. Our first speaker is Mr. John Butler, President and CEO of Akibia Therapeutics and Chair of the Kidney Care Partners Coalition. John will speak on advancements in anemia and the call for complete patient access. John, take it away. Thank you uh, very, very much. It, it's a pleasure to be here. We really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to you all about, about innovation. Um, it's, it's wonderful that AAKP is focused on this, this very important issue. Um, you know, it's it's. Um, let me tell you a little bit something about myself, so you understand, you know, why this is such a passion for me. I've been the CEO of Akibia Therapeutics for just about eight years now, and um, I've been working in kidney disease for about thirty years. And uh, I hate to say that, but it's true. Uh, but at Akibia, I, I think there's a, a real alignment of our purpose and our mission uh, with the AAKP. At, at, uh, at Akibia, our purpose is to better the life of each person impacted by kidney disease. And, and we're looking to do that through bringing new therapeutic products uh, to help patients. And uh, we're, we have a group of about 400 people who are all excited about delivering on uh, that purpose delivering for for you and your family members and and, and really making a difference in your lives. And um, as I said, you know, I've been working in this space for 30 plus years. So it, it truly is uh, a passion for me and one, you know, that I, I really am excited to come and talk to you about because I, I think that there are real opportunities here to improve uh, access for patients to these new innovative therapies. And, and, um, uh, and that's simply going to drive more innovation. So, you know, when you think about it, dialysis care hasn't really changed in uh, about 50 years. I, I said, I've been working in the space for, for about 30 years. And, you know, I, I think I was at Amgen uh, 30 years ago and, and joined shortly after uh, Epigen was introduced, which truly was an innovative product. And, you know, my oldest daughter was born just uh, just a few months after uh, I joined Amgen, and now she's almost 30 years old and teaching third grade in Raleigh, North Carolina. And yet I look at, at dialysis care and it really hasn't changed much at all. And when you compare that to other areas of healthcare, it really, uh, it's, it's actually upsetting. I mean, if you think about cancer care, I mean, there's been huge innovations. You know, think back the last 30 years and how patients, uh, cancer patients are treated for some cancers where before, you know, there was no treatment and now patients can live normal lives. Uh, and this, it's just not acceptable that kidney disease doesn't have the same uh, kind of focus. I mean, chronic kidney disease is the, the ninth largest cause of mortality for people in the U.S. This has to be 
uh, a focus for us. Um, you know, people don't even know they have kidney disease. Think about innovations in cardiovascular disease. Everybody knows their number. Everyone knows their, their cholesterol number. But GFR isn't even included in a standard panel. People don't know, uh, you know what their level of kidney disease might be. I mean, frequently patients end up on dialysis by crashing on because they didn't have any idea that they had CKD uh, before. So um, bringing innovation uh, to the care of patients with kidney disease is absolutely critical. And so let me talk a little bit about, at least in the, the drug and, and device development area, where does that innovation come from? You know, we, we are so fortunate to live in the US, uh, you know, a, a country where uh, innovation is valued and invested in. And um, uh, the way that, that drug development works in the US now is frequently uh, the really innovative products come from smaller companies. Uh, companies that are really willing to take those chances with, you know, high, uh, new, new innovative uh, areas of, of treatment. And the way those areas are funded, because the drug development's very expensive, is that there are folks in work in venture capital who make investments in, uh, in drug companies and smaller uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And you know, they are willing to take those risks, those venture capitalists, because if the drug works, there's a great return uh, at the end. Uh, patients are benefited and, um, and venture capitalists are benefited too. I mean, it's, it, it's a wonderful ecosystem. And they're very willing to take the risks of clinical development. And those risks are significant. You know, when you think about a product before or just as it's entering the clinic, the vast majority of those products never make it to a patient. You know, for, for one reason or another, uh, they don't proceed through clinical development. But when they do, these are products that can have uh, an amazing impact on patients. What venture capitalists need to know, if I take the clinical risk and the product is successful and available for patients, it has to be paid for uh, by Medicare. There has to be an opportunity to have uh, the drug paid for. So you think about dialysis care and the fact that just over 10 years ago or so, uh, Medicare instituted a bundled payment, you know, a flat payment rate for dialysis patients. And that's a great idea in, in theory to, to really control costs. But the question is, how do you incorporate innovative products into that uh, into that bundled payment system? And if you don't know that, as a venture capitalist, a person who's putting their capital at risk, you can't make that investment. I'm gonna invest in cancer care or in rare diseases, areas where I know uh, that the society will pay for uh, those drugs when they, uh, or products when they're, uh, when they're approved. So we have to bring uh, innovation to kidney disease. Kidney disease patients deserve innovation as much as a cancer patient or a rare disease patient or anyone else. Uh, and that's my passion, and I know it's it's yours as well. And um, you know, I've painted kind of a negative picture there, but you know, let me say that we really are entering a very exciting time uh, for innovation in kidney disease. There are companies and venture capitalists who've been willing uh, to make investments in new products. Akibia is just one. Um, there are products that are on the verge of approval. We hope to treat anemia uh, in chronic kidney disease patients, to treat puritis, um, to treat high phosphorus levels. You know, there's, there's technology uh, where you can actually wear a, a, an artificial kidney uh, that could completely change uh, the way dialysis is provided in this country. So it is incredibly exciting, uh, the innovation that's coming down uh, in the near term in kidney disease. We need more of it to be sure. Um, but it's exciting you know, where we are today. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that CMS has recognized the need to find a way to incorporate that innovation into the care of patients. And they introduced two uh, new payment policies, TDAPA and Timpanies for uh, new pharmaceutical products and devices uh, respectively. And what those policies do is pay for uh, new innovative drugs outside of the bundle 
for two years so that physicians uh, can understand how to use uh, these drugs, what patients are appropriate for them, because you know any uh, drug or device that you introduce isn't going to be right for every patient. And physicians need the opportunity to, to, to understand how to incorporate those into, uh, into therapy. And so they have that opportunity for, for two years. But there's the problem, of course, when you introduce a new innovative product and as a patient, you're able to access that product and it makes a difference in your life and your care and your quality of life, it, at two years, it doesn't go away, right? So right now, there's no opportunity to adjust that bundled rate uh, for dialysis for those new product opportunities, those new innovations that are going to help patients, right? So, so what we really need to look for, what Medicare really needs to think about from a policy perspective is to take what they've learned during those two years of TDAP or Timpanies about how physicians are using the product, what patients are appropriate for that, and then adjust that bundled payment rate to account for that new innovation. That way patients can continue to uh, access that innovation over the long term, and yet Medicare can continue to uh, still control costs with that, with that bundled reimbursement. We think that's a very, uh, straightforward fix that um, that aligns incentives, that allows physicians to try new innovative products, uh, allows Medicare to understand how those products should be used, and then control that that cost uh, over the long term. Um, I think aligning on that payment system uh, in a way that's fair and equitable for all the parties involved is uh, should be our goal, and I think we can we can work on that. And, and like I said, I'm encouraged by the fact that CMS understands the need to offer these innovative products for patients uh, with kidney disease. The, the second policy area that I wanted to, to talk to you about today is um, revolves around the opportunity we have to change the status quo for treatment. And we talk about dialysis care and CKD care, um, but of course, this is a continuum of care. Right? And, and what we know is the holy grail is to treat patients with chronic kidney disease early, identify them early through testing, and then treat them early to delay the progression of disease and allow them access to care. And once again, CMS recognizes this as well and is working on uh, demonstration models like Kidney Care Choices or KCC that in sense better coordination of care to achieve the goals of delaying disease progression. Um, that is such a great advance. And you know we are very, very supportive of those kinds of models that encourage patients being treated early, cared for better, delay the progression of their kidney disease. That's better for the patient, obviously, and also will reduce costs in the long term. So having those kinds of payment models is, is important. But of course, within that system, nephrologists have to be able to choose the products that they want to use to adequately treat their patients. It's very important that physicians have that ability to access products. And that's not always the case. And, and let me tell you about uh, an example that's, uh, that I know is a frustration for, uh, for many patients. Uh, at Akibia, we have a product that's available on the market now to treat iron deficiency anemia in patients who are not on dialysis. Um, so this product, it, many of you know the consequences of anemia besides uh, the fact that you are, as a patient, are constantly tired and, and um, uh, you know, don't feel like uh, getting out of bed some mornings. There's also increased rates of hospitalization, heart disease, and, and even mortality from uh, from uh, anemia. So what Orixia, the product that uh, Akibia has, allows physicians to do is to treat patients' anemia with a pill. And patients take these pills uh, each day at home and it manages their iron deficiency anemia. And um, right now, Medicare is not covering that product for, uh, for patients. So physicians can't access that product for uh, for the patients they think will benefit. And so what happens now? Well, patients now have to get an injectable product. So 
they'll have to go into the hospital or an infusion center to have a, um, uh, an iron product infused. Well, think about this in the age of, of COVID that we've been living in. You know, the last thing patients who are higher risk patients want to do is go into a medical facility and um, be exposed potentially to uh, COVID and have to get that infusible product when there's an oral product that's available to them. And what makes this even more frustrating, I think, is that virtually all commercial payers, Medicaid, they all give patients access to this product. So, um, you know, it's a real concern for Medicare patients. Now, fortunately, there are a number of members of Congress who recognize that this is an issue and they've introduced what's called the RAISE Act uh, to Congress to allow patients or have CMS pay for uh, this product for, so that patients can access the product to treat anemia or any other product, oral product, to treat anemia. And that just gives patients better access to care. And we think that's a, uh, another policy that is important for uh, AAKP to continue to advocate for. Uh, AAKP has been a great supporter and certainly recognizes how important it is to give patients choice and access to products. And, and we think the RAISE Act is another way uh, that we can uh, help uh, patients to, to get access to products that will make a difference for them. And as a kidney community, um, we are aligned in that. Uh, we all are looking for opportunities to give patients choice uh, and control of their care. And the RAISE Act is one example of that. So, you know, in conclusion, I, I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with the AAKP uh, to make a difference uh, for patients. You all do such important work. Uh, your policy focus is razor sharp. Uh, you understand what matters to patients. Uh, I've enjoyed working with your team uh, in over the years because they understand what matters. And, uh, and, and I think we at Akibia uh, do as well, and we want to support these efforts. Um, it is, uh, you know, I, I have tried to devote my professional life to finding uh, opportunities to uh, improve the care of patients with CKD. I've got 400 committed professionals uh, working with me at Akibia who all are focused on that same purpose. Uh, we want to work with you at AAKP to find more opportunities to bring those innovation, innovative products to patients with kidney disease. Thank you for letting me uh, join you for this important conference today. Thank you very much, John, for those, those remarks. Our next speaker is Reginald Cito, President and CEO of CareDX, who will speak on improving access to transplant care telehealth and technology to enable patients along the transplant journey. Reginald, take it away. As the president and uh, CEO of KDX, I'm really proud to be able to uh, work with the AKP and continue to um, bring interesting topics for, for patients, physicians, and to how we continue to progress what we do with transplants and the transplant community. Today's talk itself will be on improving access to transplant care with a bit of a focus on telehealth and technology and how that's really enabled patients along the transplant patient journey. And CareDX has been around for more than 20 years. Um, and for those that don't know us, you know, we have a very simple, uh, you know, mission, which is basically be the leading partner for the transplant ecosystem. So we do all things transplant, whether it's with the patient, whether it's with the center, um, whether it's with different partners and associations, but really that's all we do 100% of the time. We've been around for more than two decades, um, and that's something that we were quite well known for. In terms of our mission, we're committed to improving the long-term outcomes and that's really by driving innovative solutions throughout the entire transplant patient journey. As you can see here, um, this really reflects our focus on the, on the transplant center and what we've been able to do as an organization. Uh, we really have a, a deep presence um, across multiple different organ spaces. And you know, we first started off in the heart space where more than 90% of heart transplant centers use our offerings and more than one in two patients today um, have started on a, on a um, you know, KDX offering. On the kidney side, which is sort of the focus of today's um, you know, patient. Uh, in less than three years, we have more than 70% of centers actively using a KDX offering. And we have um, you know, one in three patients starting um, in, a, in a new transplant on a, in a KDX offering. And again, we're moving to other organ spaces, including looking at the, um, at the lung, and that will come later on this year as well. 
So what is, what is KDX known for? As you can see on the other slide, we really talked about how we're a leading partner for the ecosystem and the examples with transplant centers. The other area that we're really well known for is bringing innovative solutions. So what you see here is three examples of where we were the first in the space. And I think the first one is, we're the first to bring gene expression profiling in transplant through, through Alamap. We're the first to bring donor-derived cell free DNA in transplant, which is our shore. And we're the first to bring multimodality approach to transplant known as heart care. And so it's important for us to keep on bringing offerings that are not only just you know, meaningful and relevant to patients, but something that continues to drive the space. And you know, throughout our 20 years, we've been known as an innovator and that's something that we continue to, um, to deliver on as well. And so this, this slide actually depicts a bit of that journey um, for the transplant patient. And as you can see here, we have, we have multiple touch points, whether you look at pre-transplant, post-transplant, or, um, or even uh, peri-transplant. And as you can see here on the pre-transplant side, we're involved in many areas. The first is we, we have an offering now which connects the transplant um, centers to the dialysis centers, and that's known as TX Connect. We just introduced that offering uh, this year. We also are actively involved in the waitlist management. So we have more than 7,000 patients of the, of the 90,000 plus who are on a waitlist being managed by KDX through ZenCare. And we also deliver um, you know, HLA typing. So the latest type of uh, technology in, in NGS um, through hybrid capture, and that's known as LSE TX70, the first new innovation that's been truly brought to the space. As you move on the post-transplant side here, what you'll see is um, multiple offerings. We just mentioned Alashore, which is the donorized cell free DNA, um, which looks at any you know, form of cell injury. And then also you, you'll see a combination of different offerings that we're bringing, which are in different stages of um, you know, research within the organization. We have um, iBox, which is a validated algorithm, which sort of serves as a prognostic. So one thing that what we, what we believe is adding to clinical utility, so having more than one offering. So you'll see Alashore combined with the iBox, and we also have combined with a gene expression um, profiling test, which looks at the immune state uh, of the organ, and that's known as Alamap. So these offerings today are an active um, uh, study um, that we're, we're doing called Okra. And so with this exciting work, we've also brought in other different offerings to combine with that. So we have a urinary mRNA test called um, Uramap, uh, which was partnered with the, you know, the, the world leader from um, uh, Cornell and this Dr. Sutan. We also have uh, LOID, which is a metagenomic um, infectious disease test, which looks at 100 different plus pathogens in, in one tube, and that goes across bacteria, virus, parasite, and fungi. So really, you know, compelling way to continue to differentiate the space. And the third is um, uh, Histomap, which is a gene expression uh, test used with, with tissue samples. So as you can see here, driving innovation is core of what we do. Um, as you move forwards, we also play a role in electronic medical records for the centers, improving that workflow, as well as things such as quality management systems. and um, obviously continuing with, with further clinical studies with multiple centers. And as you, as you look at what we do as a company, we, we just gave the examples of supporting the transplant patient transplant center. We, we have an entire team which is dedicated um, around each of these transplant centers. So we have an account manager, we have um, a medical science liaison. Um, we obviously have a mobile offering called RemoTrack, which you'll hear about um, during the course of this presentation. And then also we have, um, you know, other areas, which are particularly our patient care management team, which is sort of front and foremost of how we continue to support, um, you know, patients throughout their journey as well. So we have someone that is personalized um, and contacting each of these patients as they look at their different schedules. And so we now get to the, you know, the, the base of the discussion um, today is we look at advances in, you know, telehealth and advances in, um, you know, this remote space. And really during the course of, um, you know, last year, and I think the word unprecedented has been used many times, but I think without doubt, every single person has been somewhat impacted by COVID. Um, and it, it really has transformed the way that, you know, we've had to look at what we do, but also every single business, I think, in, in the world has had to reassess that. And I think for us, a couple a couple of things were really important for us. You know, the need for remote offerings and, and services for patients were really, um, were really important, particularly during that peak of COVID where, you know, there, were, there really wasn't, um, a way to necessarily get into the um, transplant center or there wasn't a way necessarily to get labs done and it really was just you know a time which i think you know was, was was very scary and you know how do we keep patients safe was front and foremost and you know sort of our our sort of thinking so as we went along that journey these are just some of the examples of you know how we evolved as an organization and how we developed some of the different uh, offerings so i'll i'll mention three of these just on this slide but during the start of covid 
um, in March 17th, we actually um, announced the start of Remote Track, which is a remote mobile phlebotomy. Today, we have more than 150 centers that um, use this, more than 7,000 patients that have registered. And uh, this is a service where I think, you know, essentially addressed some of the, the concerns we'd heard about safety and the ability to have um, some of these tests done at home and also access issues during the peak of COVID. And I think this is something that was, you know, nine out of 10 patients say, you know, this is something they, they still appreciate and they still want to have. And most of the transplant centers also say the same thing. As we look at during the course of COVID, we developed in our, our digital offering. So what you hear is in um, September, we announced um, Allocare, which is our transplant specific app, which I'll touch upon, upon as well during this presentation. And that was a way to digitally connect um, with patients and also provide them with different forms of communication and also information to be shared as well as part of that um, that direct dialogue. And then, you know, lastly at the start of this year, another example we brought was really this connecting the dialysis patient to the transplant center. And this is the um, the TX Connect offering, which is offered through the centers as well. And so I'll go through, um, you know, these three examples. You know, Remo, Remo Track really was, you know, an incredible um, sort of offering that was put together in less less than a week. And that's because there was this so much of demand. How do we help out during this, this time of COVID? And what we did here was we're able to, um, you know, work with the centers. There are about 200 plus in the United States, transplant centers, and, you know, more than 150 have interest. And so we, we knew there was strong demand to how do we support during this during this time that actively reached out as well as patients. Um, and then how do we continue to um, sort of build upon this? We needed to have more of these patient care managers who could help you know schedule and support these patients so that we ended up hiring 40 what we call patient care managers in a period of you know less than a month and then we had to create this mobile phlebotomy network um something which you know we we didn't have existing at the time of um covid so um what you reflect upon here is as a company we we felt there was and we understood there was a need for remote offerings and this is something that i think is seen as one of the most you know impactful things we've done as a company because you know, patients didn't have a way of um, accessing blood draws and um, centers didn't have a way of getting back results. And this is not just um, something that was done with kidney patients, but it was obviously in heart patients, lung patients. And I do mention that because, you know, part of the testings post-transplant include in the lung side, what's called an invasive bronchoscopy or on the, on the heart side, some biopsies. And, and these weren't able to be done during the peak of COVID. So having the ability to have, you know, diagnostic biomarkers, which could add to clinical utility and support their, ma their management patients absolutely critical. And obviously we, we take that often for granted on the kidney side, um, being a much larger patient pool where we see, you know, different levels of innovation we've brought, but clearly on the on the heart and lung side, this is also thing that was really important as well. And so as we move on to this this digital app, which we launched um, in, at the end of September last year, and this is really um, an important app because it was developed by transplant patients, transplant centers. It wasn't something that, you know, we took off the shelf and it was really something that was, um, you know, built from scratch and uh, one where, you know, all the usability and app features were meant to be relevant for the, the patients in the centers. And I think what's important is also to have refreshed and important content. So that's something that we felt was important as we developed the app. And also ensuring that there was a way of communication among the communities. There's an active chat board that can be used as well. In terms of the, the app features, you know, medic medication management is often so critical, particularly with compliance. And so that's an area that as a remote offering, we thought was important to provide these reminders as part of that um, with the app. And also just different um, health um, metrics monitoring. So there's direct connection with different physiological parameters, which um, the patient could track as, as, as part of that, which we felt was an important way for them to see how they were, um, uh, they could monitor themselves as part of this process. And then really just the whole ordering workflow, they could have the option of calling up a patient command or doing it directly through the app itself. So really features that were meant to um, you know, be beneficial and functional for the for the patient. And in terms of usability, um, the ability now to track this medication adherence, how often they, they take the medications, but also just the different health tracking tools. Um, you know, we've received excellent feedback on that. And, you know, they've set, they set their own goals and there's ability to, um, you know, check in on those and how they're performing as well. At the end of the day, it's, it's a customizable um, interface. And so if we think of where we're evolving, um, you know, with patients being more, more remote, then having a, a way to digitally connect is so important. And that's why Allocare has, you know, become the standard as we look at how we look at transplant um, specific apps, particularly because it was designed again by transplant patients and also transplant centers. And it wasn't an off-shelf solution. It was a very tailored specific solution for the transplant community. And so the, the third, um, you know, offering we'd mentioned, and this is something that came this year, is 
we know with the with the kidney initiative um, there are many different areas that are going to change um, as a course of that so how do we increase the number of um, organ transplants for example how do we you know increase donation and transplantation rates and so dialysis centers um, you know will now be moving more patients across in the referral um, waitlist um, process and I think as part of that you know we felt we had a role in how do we you know, help that patient uh, journey. And so we have TX Connect, which is really a cloud-based solution. It's very seamless. It's um, links directly with the with the EMR, so it allows the um, electronic data records to be done in a fairly seamless way and information to be captured and to be sent across to the transplant center. Um, and we, we see this as a, a referral management tool um, that we have. Now, in terms of, if you look at the referring source, um, it, it's great for them because it, basically provides you know, dialysis um, center of the nephrology practice with a single dashboard. It shows the, the patient status, um, when's the next appointment, you know, and, and some of the, these things you take for granted, but a lot of, a lot of this is still done by paper. So having, you know, a, an electronic way of doing this is, is actually important um, as you connect the different dots. And we feel like we have a role to play there, connecting all the different dots and, and, and pieces. Also allows for that bi-directional way of communication and messaging, which I think is also um, important that can be done, um, you know, real time as well. If you're in a transplant center, I think, you know, for them, it really, with the number of patients, you know, coming through and that will increase during the course of this year and, and each year fourth, as we look at this increase in, you know, referral rates and ultimately wait list management, then it, it streamlines that, that process for them. They get to control the structure and the process and what that looks like as well. And it's done in a very, um, you know, systematic and structured way. And then it allows them also this, this two way, um, messaging with the referral source. At, at the end of the day, it has the potential to actually reduce um, the time from referral to listing, which I think is absolutely important as we think of this, um, you know, this patient journey. The more we can do to help out is just so critical. So, as you see today, with this with this whole world to moving to more remote based or digital solutions, um, I think there are three you know specific examples here. You know, remote track was a way of you know dealing with a you know remote patient. Um, you know, allocare was a way of saying how do we connect up that that patient, whether with the community and also with the transplant center, but also with our patient commanders. And I think what you see here with um, you know TX Connect is a way that we're anticipating part of the future and how we can continue to help out um, in this space. You know, use this as sort of the the final slide. What it, what it does show is really um, a patient journey, and it and it is a long one, right? It, it is a long journey, whether you know, you have end-stage renal disease, then going to dialysis, um, and then going all the way to referral, and then eventually on to um, getting uh, onto the wait list itself, and then, you know, having to go through the different um, stages, you know, waiting for an organ, and then actually going for the transplant itself, and then obviously the post-transplant um, monitoring. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a long, longitudinal, long process, and many different stages. What I want to echo from this slide itself is that you know KDX will be with you at every every stage, and so we've developed uh, offerings and services that will be part of that journey. Um, and this is the you know example of that. And obviously we have more offerings that will come as part of this. But I do think as you know, a company that's been dedicated for transplant for more than years, 20 years, as a company that's 100% focused on transplant, and the company that you know spends more than $60 million a year on R&D or towards um, transplant. Every you know, single R&D dollar goes towards how do we continue to improve that patient journey. That's our singular focus. Um, we have many people at our company um, that have a direct and personal connection. Uh, our head of clinical ops is a, is a, is a KP patient. Our um, head of sales, uh, his, his daughter is a heart transplant recipient. Um, one of our um, account managers in, uh, in Florida, her, daughter um, is a kidney transplant recipient. So for all of us, you know, this this is something that's really important for us. We we know the struggles that you go through. Um, it's not easy. Um, it's not an easy journey at all. And that's why we think it's so important for us to connect that patient journey. And we, we have an absolute role as a company to support you and you continue to bring, you know, meaningful offerings. So I really want to thank the AKP for this wonderful opportunity. I mean, we, we, we love the way that we can continue to engage with associations. We continue to engage with patients and you know, that hopefully we can contribute to make a difference in, in what you do um, in your life every day because it's, it's not an easy journey as a, as a transplant patient. So thank you again for the privilege and honor on behalf of KDX to speak to you all today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reginald, for those wonderful remarks. Our next speaker is Dr. Amit Sharma. 
U.S. Vice President of Medical Affairs, Cardiovascular and Renal at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. I have a few questions for you, Dr. Sharma. Building off of your experience in policy, can you comment on your views why patient care choice and access to new treatment matters for patients and their families? Ed, now there are new and emerging options for patients. We need to make sure patients have broad access to all of the tools in our limited toolbox and testing treatments and medicines uh, for all patients. Patients should be confident that they're being provided guidelines concordant to the care that they need. As you may know, although African-Americans account for more than 35% of all patients in the U.S. who receive dialysis for kidney failure, they represent just 13.2% of the overall population. More likely to have diabetes, these patients, and they're more likely to su suffer severe complications, including kidney failure, and cardiac events. Access to all these treatment options through trusted community-based providers is essential for equitable care. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Another question for you. For our audience of government and policy leaders, especially those engaged in discussions about the direct and indirect costs of diabetic kidney disease on national health budgets, what are the care innovations that you think will make a difference, not only in patient health outcomes, but also on efforts to lower the burden of the diabetic kidney disease cost for society. Are there both short-term and long-term innovations that hold promise for both governments and patients? As you know, every day in this country, over 300 patients start dialysis. According to the CDC, Medicare beneficiaries with late stage CKD cost the program over $84 billion and treatment of individuals with end-stage kidney disease or dialysis cost increased an additional $36 billion to the overall Medicare spending. As kidney function declines and patients advance in this disease, the cost to treat these patients increased. Despite this, people with CKD are still underdiagnosed and undertreated. Studies have shown that rising inpatient hospital costs accounted for at least 80% of the cost increases observed with disease progression into later CKD stages. If we treat earlier in this disease, we can be avoiding these costs substantially. There have been recent notable events helping to shape improved care for patients at lower cost. These innovations are vitally important for us helping this very sick population. As you know, CKD is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. Treating earlier can lessen the risk of cardiovascular events that have a high economic and human toll. Pharmaceuticals, including Bayer, working to prevent kidney disease progression and treat earlier in this disease process are vitally important to make sure patients are treated optimally and these care innovations that will make a difference include new and emerging treatments after two decades of basically no innovation. And long term, we feel as a company, but also as a part of the nephrology community, that we're committed to making this a sustainable and achievable idea. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. One more question for you. To most effectively manage diabetic kidney disease, it's widely accepted that going upstream and identifying individuals in the earlier stages of kidney disease is crucial to intervening at a time when one, one may be more successful in slowing the progression of kidney disease. Can you share how Bayer is changing the paradigm in advancing early diagnosis and identification? Bayer recognizes that CKD is irreversible and needs to be addressed as early as possible. We have worked with key stakeholders, including AAKP, to change the chronic kidney disease paradigm by identifying and diagnosing those in the earlier stages of disease. We're committed to delivering therapies that make a meaningful difference in all our patients' lives. With the investment we've made in the clinical trials and our future commitment, Bayer is committed to delivering change to patients and those who care for them. Examples of partnering with stakeholders include the following. 
We've been effective in combination with the AAKP and other bodies uh, to effectively annualize screening protocols using urinary albumin creatinine ratios. Uh, these have been put in effect and we're glad to announce the newest HEDIS measure around screening people with type two diabetes will be incredibly effective in identifying patients who suffer from this chronic disease. We're also committed to supporting this quality metric with multiple initiatives that are either started or will start in the future. Additional collaborations include that we've collaborated with societies like the American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation on their 33% campaign to raise awareness of the chronic kidney disease um, and also working with Quest Diagnostics on UACR ordering. We are also collecting data in conjunction with medical center partners to understand the use of annual screening. As we collaborate with American Kidney Fund and the Veterans Administration to identify as many veterans with CKD as possible, I'm very, very pleased to announce all these initiatives and we are in one with the patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Martin, Professor of Internal Medicine and Director of the Division of Nephrology at St. Louis University, who will speak on managing hyperparathyroidism and hemodialysis. Dr. Martin, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. It's nice to have the opportunity today to talk a little bit about recent developments in the treatment of hyperparathyroidism. And hyperparathyroidism, as you know, is one of the uh, complications of chronic kidney disease that needs attention for a variety of reasons. On the next slide, you can see my disclosures. Uh, I have been on the medical advisory board and served as a consultant and speaker for Amgen. I also serve on the medical advisory board for Ardelix. And I have a few roles on the data safety monitoring boards for a variety of studies, uh, working uh, for Ellipsa, Applied Therapeutics, and for Triceda. We'll provide an introduction to this area. It used to be that disturbances in calcium, phosphorus, and parathyroid hormone and vitamin D metabolism uh, were traditionally recognized and treated for their role in renal bone disease or the bone disease associated with kidney disease, and namely renal osteodystrophy. You can see that in recent years, it's now recognized that the consequences of these abnormalities in mineral metabolism extend much beyond the skeleton and have been implicated as important factors in cardiovascular disease and even mortality in patients with chronic kidney disease or CKD. Uh, really illustrates that these are overlapping problems. On, on one hand, we have these biochemical abnormalities, which we use to uh, quantitate the severity of the abnormality and as a guide to treatment. Uh, and the bony abnormalities, which can lead to fractures and a lot of uh, bone pain, etc. Uh, and then also overlapping this is the vascular calcification, which is abnormal and results in a variety of problems, most notably for its role in cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and mortality. This illustrates what happens with the parathyroid glands during the course of chronic kidney disease, where they grow from a very small uh, gland in the neck uh, and gradually enlarges as a manifestation of the overactivity of these glands. And, and as time goes on, if untreated, the glands can go very big and and uh, develop various abnormalities, which makes this more difficult to treat as time goes on. So what this means in practical terms is it's important to try to identify and treat this problem early in the course of chronic kidney disease to prevent rapidly enlarging parathyroid glands, which will cause problems down the line and make treatment difficult if it's allowed to progress uh, too much. Uh, really summarizes our management strategies for dealing uh, with this problem. And it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, these uh, factors that we use to uh, uh, identify this problem uh, all um, deserve treatment in their own right. 
And so the principles of treating this are to control serum phosphorus because it gets retained in the course of chronic kidney disease. If calcium is low, that needs to be corrected because it's a powerful stimulus for parathyroid hormone secretion and parathyroid growth. There's abnormalities in vitamin D metabolism, as I said at the outset, and these can also be treated and it's a useful way to, uh, to try to get this problem under control. And lastly, but not least, and the particular uh, topic I want to address today is the use of this class of drugs called calcimimetics. These are agents which act like serum calcium and basically instruct the parathyroid gland to uh, decrease the secretion of parathyroid hormone. And we'll talk a little bit about those very effective agents uh, for controlling this problem. And we do all of these things in the context of minimizing the calcium burden. Um, most often uh, by limiting calcium containing phosphate binders uh, because of the role of excess calcium in uh, facilitating the progression of vascular calcification. You can see the effect of the calcimimetic agent here. This was the initial one, a uh, uh, sinicalcet hydrochloride. And then the blue line in each of the panels, you can see the effect of uh, lowering of PTH, calcium and phosphorus that bring them into the target range uh, with the use of a calcimimetic like this. So you can achieve very effective biochemical control of the problem uh, with this agent. And this was really a breakthrough in the treatment uh, that is uh, widely used in patients that uh, need it today. The problem with this uh, medicine is that as the doses increase, it tends to be associated with some nausea. And it was interesting to know uh, these data from a, a colleague of ours at uh, Washington University uh, looked at the Missouri Kidney Program and looked at the refill rate for sinicalcet. Now, these are patients on the Medicaid program who can get the medicines really delivered to the dialysis unit. But you can see that the refill rate of these prescriptions as time goes on is only about 30% or so. So the problem with this medicine is uh, patient compliance. As the dose is increased, because I think it makes them a little nauseated, they don't like to take it. Uh, and so never refill the prescription, even though uh, they will attest to the fact that they are taking it. Uh, then recently, or in more recent years, a different calcimimetic was introduced. And this one can be injected. It has a, a long action, so it can be given at the end of dialysis treatments. And you can see in the orange line here, these are two identical randomized controlled trials. It also achieves excellent uh, biochemical control of, the, of hyperparathyroidism, reducing parathyroid hormone itself, uh, reducing phosphorus values, uh, and uh, allowing calcium to fall a little bit since the, the medicine uh, informs the parathyroid gland that the calcium is high when in fact it's really not. The considerations for prescribing this and what makes this medicine advantageous is that you can give it IV, um, so you're not depending on the patient to take it. It has a very long action uh, so that uh, if you miss a dose here or there for whatever reason, it really doesn't matter. You can continue along. In the early stages of the development of this drug, uh, we noticed that it was much less nauseating uh, than the orally active agent, although it's been difficult to show that convincingly when one tries to study it. And because of its long action, the timing of measuring the lab values, particularly the parathyroid hormone level, really becomes a non-issue compared to the oral drug. So all seems well that this should be uh, preferable uh, and it is very effective in controlling the problem. So the clinical practice guidelines recommend consideration of parathyroidectomy in patients who are refractory to medical therapy. And that's really loosely defined, but has PTH values that are above 800 or so, uh, and if the calcium is high. And removing the parathyroid glands is an effective treatment, obviously, for hyperparathyroidism, but it does involve general anesthesia, it does involve surgery, uh, it does involve a lot of uh, short-term complications after that. So that's not something that should be or is taken lightly uh, for patients. So the issues that have arisen with this 
uh, in prescribing and using this medicine called etyl calcetide uh, was that it was initially reimbursed with an add-on payment for hemodialysis treatment. And following the assessment of, of use, CMS decided to increase the capitation payments uh, for each dialysis patient, whether they required the medicine or not, in order to cover the cost. So this leads to problems today because there's extreme resistance of dialysis providers to allow the use of this medication and the requirement that they have to fail uh, dosing regimens, off-label dosing regimens with the oral calcium medic, and even go as far as to suggest parathyroidectomy rather than use this injectable medicine. So this is a, a, a problem uh, on access that uh, the cost was supposed to be covered by incre increasing the monthly capitation payment, but this is not really happening in practice. The, the dialysis providers do everything in their power to discourage the use of this medicine while happily uh, taking the increased uh, reimbursement for dialysis. So it's, uh, it, the effect of this really is to limit the availability of this drug uh, and that therefore limits the ability to control uh, this um, problem in the patient group. And it's probably something that deserves another look and maybe uh, the payment scheme can be revised uh, so that uh, this drug is available uh, to patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We appreciate everyone taking the time to share their insights.